Hey, Sean here from speedcubereview.com. About a few years ago, I made a video on fewest moves technique. I spent a month doing nothing but fewest moves, and it's I'm still really happy with the way those videos turned out, but through the years, I've learned quite a few things, and also I wanted to make a video with better lighting and better effects and everything like that. So this is a really long video or it's planning to be, I'm assuming it's going to be, but I'm gonna put timestamps for each section. So you can just, if you want to learn about edge orientation, you can click on that timestamp, it's in the description and go right to that. The idea is not to watch this entire video straight through, but if you want to do it, I am not going to stop anyone. Now with all the techniques here, this is practically everything that even a world-class fewest move solver does. All the topics I'm going to go over is going to be right on the side of the video and throughout each thing I'm going to possibly show a solve of how it is used. So let's get to the first topic. Okay, so this first section is going to go over the basics for fewest moves. Now you might hear this also called fewest moves challenge. That is actually the full name for FMC. Now one thing to know is that you don't need to have any specific method for FMC. If you know how to solve a cube, you can do FMC. I know a lot of people who just go in and do CFOP solves and kind of spend an hour doing that until they find something that works best, write that down and you are done. There are some limitations. So let's pull up what an FMC sheet looks like. Now in this, there's a couple things we need to go over. So the first thing, make sure your name is on it. I don't know if you need to have your WCID on it when you're competing. I think you can just have your name and that's it but I always just put it on anyways. So it says a couple rules on the top left. It says you have 60 minutes to find and write a solution, write one move per bar to delete a move, clearly black it out. And this is something that if you are unsure you're changing a move, scratch it out and either rewrite it or just scratch it out completely and use the next space. I know someone who tried erasing some things and an apostrophe looked like it was still there and the person was told that it looked close enough to where it was counted as a prime move, which ended up being a DNF for the solve. So make sure you either blacken it out or in right next to it or just on the next space completely. It says that your solution must not be directly derived from any part of the scrambling algorithm. So you can't do a few moves from the scramble and just reverse that. There have been instances where someone's solve was really close and that is up to the delegate to decide if that works. But yeah, you can't just do the scramble backwards. It says the result will be counted in the OBTM, which is outer block turning metric. So M slices are not allowed. There are some moves that are allowed that are not on the sheet. And this is something to keep in mind. This sheet is from the end of July in 2019, and it might change to the next year. And we'll talk about that in a second with some different moves. It says only use notation for article 12 of the WCA regulations. If you're uncertain, use only the exact moves listed here. So it has clockwise, counterclockwise, double moves and rotations. Now it says in article 12 at the moment that rotations can also be Y, X and Z. And there's also wide moves are allowed. So doing F, W, R, W, U, W. Don't use lowercase, use the W. I wish they put that on the paper because it looks like it is not allowed, but it definitely is at the moment. There was some talk about eliminating rotations. I'm not a big fan of that, but we'll see. So just always ask your delegate. And we have the scramble and then 80 spaces. So your solution can be up to 80 moves and that counts rotations though. So if you, let's say, have a 75 move solution with five rotations and it fills the whole page, your solution is 75, it's not 80. So you can use that. Now, I would generally avoid rotations. This was difficult for me when I started because, you know, I'm used to F being the front and U being the top. But what you want to do is if you can limit rotations, it makes techniques and everything a little bit easier as you go. So I'm going to grab a cube here. And one thing you would want to do is green would always be F, U would always be up, red would always be right, blue is back, orange is left, and yellow is down. Or however you're scrambling. If you have an odd colored cube, I guess that's different, but try to use this more standard color or just colors in general because that's what's going to be on the page as the example of what the scramble should look like. Now, when I was trying to get away from doing rotations, what I remembered was that R 
for right, B for back. And that helped me orient things a lot. So if you can get used to that right away, do that. Now, before we get started, one thing to note is you don't need a lot of algorithms for furious moves and actually some of the best solvers rarely use a single pre-made algorithm. So it's not a thing we have to learn a bunch of new stuff. And I'm generally gonna organize this in three tiers. What you need to do to be sub 40, what you need to do to be sub 35, and what you need to do to be sub 30. And I consider sub 30 as maybe professional, sub 35 is intermediate, and sub 40 as beginner, but knowing, you know, some general tips and tricks. With just doing CFOP, you can have solves 50 to 60 moves just by trying to be efficient and doing a normal solve. So this first section, being some 40, block building and edge orientation. These might be two of the biggest things. Block building is a little more intuitive, but edge orientation is something that I think some, a lot of people struggle with to start, but once you know how to do it, it just takes practice to be able to recognize things faster. Let's go for block building. All block building is, is just not being restricted to doing, let's say a cross for CFOP or making one specific thing. It's just trying to pair pieces. And that's generally it. But let's go over some things you can do to try to help with that. So this scramble, I'm gonna use scrambles that are in solutions from actual online competitions that, I would, that I've done every week for quite a while. So cubing time, this is from cubing time, and I did this one just actually this past week. So I'll put the scramble in the video so you can see that. And now looking at this, what I'll often look for first is a matching pair and see what I can do with that. Another tip that you can do, and some people just call this the brute force method, is where on each side you will just do a few turns and see if anything matches up. Now I'll, I will sometimes just do this right away. If I don't see any blocks, and maybe I've already checked EO or not. I'll just do this because it only takes honestly a few seconds to kind of go through it. But I see this and so I want to try to pair this up. When you look at something that's a two by two by one block, you can see it pairs up with the blue and white edge or the orange and white edge. And then of course these centers. So like doing this, that does the center, but I need to pair it up with either that edge or the blue and white edge. So I see this orange and white here, and all I'm going to do is set this up. So that's right there. And then I need to move this piece here. So I do that. So this is D, R, F2. And then from there, okay, where is the blue and white edge? And I see it's right here. So from here, I could do L prime, Oh, B prime, and that sits up with that center, and then just L prime again. And this might take a little more time to see where pieces can go to make these sort of blocks. And the more solves you do, you'll start being able to recognize them and say, oh, if this piece needs to go here, I can just do this and this and this. When I started, people would show me how they made blocks, and I'd be like, okay, that's great, and I try to do it, and it takes a ton more moves, and I just don't see it. The more you do, the more you solve, the more you'll be able to see those movements. But that's about it, because once I have this block here, then you can do a lot. You can build off almost anything. And one tip, especially for block building, is don't stick to one color. Be color neutral. Don't always put white on bottom. So from here, let's say if we're doing something that turns into a CFOP type solve, I could put blue on bottom, and let's say we do that or I could put white on bottom and solve that. Now you, again, you don't wanna do cross like I'm kind of showing here, but I can see with like this pair, I could do that and I still have that pair made, or maybe do this. And now I've made a two by two by three, which looking at my notes, I actually didn't even do that. Like I said, fairly straightforward, and but there's so many variations. There's not one algorithm or anything to do and it's really up to you to try to find as many blocks as you can. Just practice trying different ways and look at other solves, see how other people did. It might give you new ideas or tips on how to move certain pieces around. But it almost starts with always having a two by one by one, so like a pair, and then turning it into a two by two by one, which often people will call a square, 
and then turning that to a two by two by two. And then from there, two by two by three, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm gonna stick to the same scramble for this next one, and we're gonna talk about EO, edge orientation. A lot of top solvers will even just start with EO almost every single time. And there's been discussion of if you just start EO, you're you're bound to have good solutions if that's so you're like your sort of methodology to start with that. I remember when I started, I found a really good F2L minus one. It was like 13 moves and I was really pumped and I asked some help on how to finish it. And there was really nothing because nothing was really oriented. It was hard to get anything going from there. So what is edge orientation? Well, I'll first show you just on here. So what it is, if you, let's say, orient the front and back, you can insert all pieces without doing any F or B moves. And this is common in ZZ. And when I say common, I actually mean that's literally how ZZ method starts. Okay, so I'm gonna use the same scramble that I already used for the other one, just to keep things simple. And I'm first just going to show what EO does by doing sort of like a ZZ solve, I guess, or I'll do CFOP, but I'll just orient edges first. Then I'll go over how you actually find bad edges that are misoriented. So here's a scramble again. And just by holding white and bottom, green in front, which is how I'd usually do something like ZZ, we look for bad edges and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, what am I missing? I'm missing something somewhere. Ah, down here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There it is. Okay. And so for this, what I'm going to do is move things to the front or back and do an F or a B move. So here, 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 here. And now all the edges are oriented. And I'll show you what that means then, where I can just solve the entire cube, or at least first two layers, without doing any F or B moves. And everything just falls really nicely into place, like that. Although orienting edges restricts the movements you can do, often things just really nicely fall into place. My best solve at a competition was a 22. At the moment, that's my best. And I literally just oriented edges and did sort of like a ZZ solve and it just fell into place. So how do you find bad edges? Well, let me scramble the cube and make all of the edges bad. And then I'm gonna scramble the cube and make all edges Good, so you can see first just how it looks. Looking at these two cubes, they don't look very different. But this one, every edge is oriented correctly and everyone here is oriented incorrectly. There are bad edges here, good edges here. So how do you tell the difference? Well, you don't need to look at every individual piece and say, does that need an F move to, to go into place or a B move? Or depending on which axis you're looking on, can you get here, then it's L or R moves. Or if you look here, it's, it's not that difficult. Um, there's only three different axes you need to look at, meaning you can just look green in front, red in front, or white in front. That's all there is until we get to inverse, which I'll explain that later. But that's all. So you don't need to check every single side. All you need to do is look at a certain color. So what you're going to look at is the top of the cube and bottom, and then the front and back on the E layer. So these four edges, these four edges, here and here, and here and here. And there's a couple rules to go by. If you see the top and bottom color on any of those spots, it's a good edge. So for example, white and yellow are top and bottom. There's no white or yellow here, none here, none here, none there. But on this one, we've got white, yellow, white, yellow, white, white, yellow, yellow. A lot of them have that. Counter to that, if you see the left and right color, so this one's gonna be orange or red, and any of them, it's automatically bad. So that's bad, 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 bad. On this cube, we don't see a single red or orange on any of those spots. And then this one's a little, has two steps. If you see the front and back color, it's good if the other color on that edge is left to right. It's bad if it's top or bottom. So here's green, but yellow is on the other side, so that's bad. Blue, yellow's on the other side, that's bad. Green, white's on the other side, that's bad. But here we've got blue, but red, that's good. Green, but red, that's good. Green, but orange, that's good. 
blue, but orange, that's good. So let's go through an actual scramble and I'll show you how this was used in a solve. Now, if you have any questions on any of this, leave it in the comment section below. I literally see every comment that goes through and even if this video gets a year, two, three years old, I will help to answer your questions as best as I can. Okay, so the scramble that we had earlier, let's look at that. Now, the best thing to do is to try multiple ways of orienting edges and also from different axes. So green in front, red in front, and like that. So for example, I'm gonna show two. I'll first show the one that I think I actually, yep, this is the one I actually used for this solution, which ended up being a 27. I did green in front. So let's find all the bad edges. You will always have an even number of bad edges. If you find an odd number, you counted wrong. So up on the top, we've got one, two, because that's blue and white, one, two, three. Let's do the bottom. We've got one and two, so that's five. And then we've got six, seven, and eight. Now eight's usually pretty good. You can solve four and then four more. So what I did here was I first did a D move, which moved that to there and that to here. So now we have a bad edge here, here, and here, as well as here, 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 and there. So the only last one we have that's not set is this one. And what I could do is orient these in the back. So just do a B or a B prime, either of those work, and then do L, F. What I ended up finding that I liked was I did a B prime, and that made a block as well. And then I did L, and then F. So I had a block here and a block there, and it's able to do different things with that. So I'm gonna show you one more just to demonstrate this one final time. This is a solve from the speed solving forum. And this was from actually just the other day. I think yesterday or two days ago, I did this. All right, now this one, I also did the front and back. And so looking for bad edges, we've got here, so one, two, um, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. Three, and then four. So one, two, three, four. So all I had to do was move this right side down so it's in front, upside over, and now we've got them all four on this front face, and so all I'm gonna do is F. And that's it. Now like I said, you can also do it on the right side where here I would look for green, and blue are, would be bad, so like that one right there, that would be bad. And then anything that's orange with white, so that one, or red and yellows, so that would be bad. That would be good though. And there is a way of orienting on both sides, and I'll talk about that later when we get into partial domino reduction and full domino reduction. You don't have to do edge orientation at the very beginning. You can also do it part way through. So a lot of solves, I'll make a block or two by two by two and then orient edges. Sometimes there's not an efficient way of doing it. Like there's maybe a six or a seven move EO. They, I've had some great solves with doing a six move EO, but often if I see something like that, I'll just skip it and try making blocks and then do that later. Now, one thing I'm gonna cut in here, this is from later in the video, when you have edge orientation, there's a different ways of orienting them. If you have four, obviously you put four on one face and you're done. But let's say you have two that need to be oriented. Well, you orient one, which messes up three, and then you replace that with another one. So for example, here, this is misoriented and so is this one. So I fix one and then that messes up this, this, and this bring over the other one and fix that. Now the cube is now solved, but you get the point. Let's say if we have six bad edges, we could solve four and then we have the two left, or we can do is solve three of them. So for example, maybe like this, and now we have one, two, three, four bad ones. So you did three, which messed up one, and now we have that and all those edges are now oriented correctly. On to the next section. So I'm gonna call this the intermediate section being sub 35. A lot of this has to do with 
understanding how to manipulate and use inverse of scrambles, doing what's called pseudo blocks, which I'll actually go into before I go into inverse because it sort of leads into it. I had a discussion with someone on what should be taught first, as well as NIS, and then also insertions. So let's talk about the circle. So the one thing to note is that your solve is one big circle. So for example, if let's say you have the scramble, what you do to solve it, so let's say if you're doing CFOP and you do the cross and then you continue with F to L and then you do OLL and then PLL, you end up back at the start at a solved state. Seems pretty straightforward. We have this nice circle, but how does this have to do with fewest moves? Well, we are going to use this circle to an advantage because not only can you go this way, but you can go counterclockwise. You can go backwards through it. Let's talk about pseudo blocks. So a pseudo block is basically a block or a square, things that we've done, but it's not quite complete or it's complete in a weird way. And I'll explain it like this. I'll show it like this. Let's say we have this right here. Well, much of the cube is just scrambled and we have a nice two by two by one and also that. This is basically a two by two block, although this needs to be over here, which you know doesn't make a two by two block anymore. So how do we make this work? So this is one of my favorite scrambles ever from Speed Solving Forum. This was on July 9th when I did this one. And this was the scramble that had a pseudo two by two block. So how do you solve this? What we can do is look at what the last move that we might have to do. And the last move is U. A U move would put this where it needs to be. So let's say we have our scramble. Let me write scramble is just that. That's our scramble. We have our scramble and this would be whatever moves need to be done for to make the two by two by two. Right now it's nothing. And so we have the circle and we know the end move will have to be U. So here's what you do. You do a U move plus the scramble and then you have a solid block. And so I do the pre-move U and then the scramble as it's written. And it's scrambled exactly how this might be, but with that already solved. And if you notice a lot of the blocks are in the same spot, but some have moved that would have been affected by a U move. So anything that is white. And then from here, you just solve like you normally would. And you know your last move is going to be that U. Now this could also be at any spot. It doesn't have to be a two by two by two. Uh, I'm going to make something that's probably not the most ideal. So at any spot, let's say if we make a pseudo two by two by three, and I'm just going to make up some random moves. We're going to say that we did the U move as a pre-move for the two by two by two. Let's say that this right here is B prime L D. And then the move that's going to solve this is L prime. So now to make this look like a full solve, you do L prime U, the scramble, those moves, and you will have a full two by two by three. Hey, so I realized I want to go over a couple other odd situations with uh, pseudo blocks that we might run into. So the first one is, let's say you have your scramble and you have some moves, but you have a pseudo block and you need to add a pre-move. What if you already have a pre-move here? So let's say you did a pseudo two by two by two and you've got a couple moves and the pre-move, then you do a two by two by three. Where does that one go? That one goes before. So imagine if you had your circle and you that you that your last move is a pre-move to that two by two by two. This one might be the pre-move for the two by two by three. So that two by two by two pre-move, the first one there is always gonna be the very last move in your solution. Now, another really cool trick is you can even do this for F2L. So if this is all solved, but that corner's out of the wrong and that edge is wrong. And so something like this, it's F2L, but they're in odd spots. You don't need to, takes anything out like this. 
all you have to do is set it up. So I'm going to do B. So let's say this, let's say this whole thing was leading up to F2L minus two. If I do B, that sets it up to a pseudo F2L minus one. Everything is solved except for this one block. And to fix that, we need to do B prime. And if you do B prime L prime U, the scramble and those moves, you will then have F2L minus one in two moves. All right, so that's what pseudo blocks are. And on this note that everything's a circle, we can just do it inverted. So let's make this a bit smaller and we're just gonna slide that over there. So because things can go forwards and backwards, why don't we just go backwards? And so if you took a scramble and scrambled it inverted and then solved that, the inversion of that solution would solve the scramble. So here's what I mean. Let's say our scramble, we're gonna take something really simple, is a D, L prime, B2, R prime, U prime, F. Because scrambles always start and end with R prime, U prime, F. That way you have orientation on all three edges, or all three axes, I mean. And then also it's really easy to see if someone is just doing the scramble backwards. To do something inverted, anything that's a two is just stays a B2. Anything that's 180 degrees stays that but primes and regulars are inverted. So the inversion of this is F prime U R B2 L D prime. Now there's a few things you'll notice about the inversion. Whatever pieces are set with the regular one, what's going to happen is whatever the color of the pieces is going to show up where the location is. Let me demonstrate. This cube's going to be the regular scramble, D L prime B2 R prime U prime F, and this is going to be the inverse, F prime U R B2 L D prime. And if you notice, we have this bar here. We also have a bar there. Here's a two by two by uh, one. There we go, a block, and there's a two by two by one. But the colors are slightly different. But if you notice, here is red, white, and blue colors at the orange, yellow, blue spot. Orange, yellow, blue colors in the red, white, and blue spot. Let's take this bar for an example. We have the orange and white edge right here at the blue and white spot. Blue and white edge at the orange and white spot. Let's say we solve this solution with, I'm gonna make up letters that are not going to solve it for sure. Let's say we solve the inverse with L prime, D2, F, B prime. The regular solution then of B, F prime, D2, L would solve that one. Now, of course, this doesn't come to using a short example, but that's what the inverse scramble is. You can use it to solve the regular one. You're not using the scramble itself in the solution, which is what the rules say you can't do. This is just reading it a different way. Okay, so we're back. Um, also, let's say if you have, if you've done a, a pseudo block on the inverse, well, what do you do? Well, just like the other way, so if let's say we have a few moves on the inverse, well, that pre move's gonna go on the other side. If this is the very start, let's say you're two by two by two, and you did it on the inverse here, that's gonna be then the very first move of your solution. Or just like we talked about the other one, let's say you have a two by two by two on the inverse and a pre-move. Well, that's your first move. Then let's say you do a two by two by three. Well, the pre-move is then the next one goes after that. So that one's always gonna be the first one. Just like if you did the normal scramble, the pre-move is always gonna be the very last one. And then you build out from there. But let's move this aside and go back to the circle. So we have a lovely circle here. And let's say, let's get a new color. This is way too bland. Let's go with green. So let's say we have our scramble here. You can go back and forth until your solution meets at some point where it's solved. Meaning, let's say we're gonna do cross F2L, OLL, PLL. And we do a cross. And then we get stuck and we can't find a good way to do F2L. Well, on the inverse, and here, let me get purple back out. That way I can do the inverse from purple. Well, we can just do 
F2L going this way. And then, let's say we get stuck, we can then go back and do OLL, and then we can finish off with PLL. This is what is called NIS. NIS stands for Normal Inverse Scramble Switch. So you're switching between the normal and the inverse of the scramble. Now, I would almost suggest doing this every single time. It would make no sense to just do one and ignore the other one because you often find really nice things. And let me show you an example of that. Let me finish solving these things. So here is a scramble from the fewestmoves.info website. There's a weekly competition, usually one, but they do a mean of three once a month. I'm going to throw this image right here. And this is how often people will write these solutions. So normal would just be the regular letters, but if you do the inverse, it's in parentheses. So first thing I did was edge orientation. I did U2, D prime, F prime. So I oriented edges, had a few blocks, but I couldn't really find anything great from there. So what I did was then I did that and inverted it. So I first did F, D, U2. Then I did the scramble inverted. And you can see some of my notes for things that I wrote. So I'm gonna do F prime U R, B2, D prime, L prime, sorry, L2, U, R2, L2, D, F, L2, D prime, R, B2, D2, F2, U, L2, D prime, F2, R2, F2, U prime, F prime, U, R. I used to write out the inverse on my notes, but I've gotten much better at just reading it and it saves a little bit of time. Uh, some people still feel it saves time to write it out because then they don't have to think so much. Now on the inverse, because I did EO, it, EO is already done in the inverse. It's the same thing both times. So if you do it one way, you go the other way, it's already done. And you can always check to see if your, your inverse is correct by checking blocks. So for example, um, red and green is in the green and white spot. So if I look at green and white, I sh or green and red, sorry, I should have the green and white edge. Same thing, here's red and yellow in the red and white spot. So at the red and yellow spot, I should have red and white, and I do. Okay, so now I do U prime R2 F2, D prime L2. And I have a block here, a block here, and a block here. So I made three squares and didn't really know what to do from there, but I um, was happy with that. And so what I did was I went back to the normal. So I'm actually gonna get a third cube out now. And that is the inverse right there. So I have to do L2, D, F2, R2, U, the inverse of that inversion. And let's go back up to the scramble. Do the scramble like normal, R prime, U prime, F, U, F2, R2, F2, D, L2, U prime, F2, D2. And then those three moves for EO. Oh no, was I holding the cube weird the whole time? Nope, that was good, okay. Um, so now I have three squares again. So then, with this, I just moved pieces around, like I moved that to be a two by two by two. Um, and I got to this point where I had two edges out of place, two corners out of place, and one corner twisted. That's the twisted one. So two edges and three corners, basically, incorrect. And then I did insertions, and I'll go through that in a later time, but very soon. And then writing it out, so because it is a circle, and I'm actually just going to write right here on this one. So we have the U2, D prime, F prime. Here's a scramble. And then I'm going to go backwards. So U prime is now a U. And then we have R2, and then F2, D, L2. So U prime and D prime turned into U's and D's. And then the rest of this was the D, B2, and so on and so forth until the U prime R. And if you look, my skeleton, the term skeleton is your solution up to a certain point. So, you know, the bare bones of what you have until you fill it in. U2, D prime, F prime, D, ignore that for right now, so on and so forth till we get to U prime R, and then we've got the L2, D, F2, R2, U. So imagine if this is one big circle and leads back to right there. Now, using the inverse, not only do you have more options with block building, but 
you can do edge orientation on the inverse and I found really good EO on the inverse that isn't on the regular, you will always have the same number. If you have six in misoriented edges on the regular, you will have six on the inverse for that same axis. Now, one more advanced tip is that you can actually affect another solve if you know what it's going to do on the inverse. And I'm just going to demonstrate that here. I'm not going to do a solve with that, but let's take edge orientation. So let me set this up. Okay, so I've scrambled this a little bit and we're going to do on the this axis where we have R and L in the front and back. So let's find our bad edges. And on the top, we've got one, two, three. On the very bottom, we've got one. And then in the middle, we've got one. And then that's it. So we have six bad edges, it looks like. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, but looking at this, I know that I can see I've got a lot of red edges. So one, two, three, actually, no, not that one. One, two, three of them are bad. And I've got one, two, three that are green and yellow, green and white, and orange and yellow. Well, if you have six, like I said earlier in the video, I kind of went back in time from this spot, that you could solve four and then have two left, or you can do three, fix three of them, which makes one bad, and then you have four left. And if I do something like this, I now have one, two, three, four bad edges that are all red. And I know that if I do the inverse from here, they'll all be on the red face. So using your knowledge on how pieces move when you do the inverse, you can set things up. That took me a little while to kind of figure out and it, it took a lot of time for me to think about and I felt like it was a little bit wasteful when I was starting out, but it's definitely paid off and it's worked out really well where you can set things up and do things in much fewer moves than just trying to do it all one way. Okay, so we're back for a third time. So let's say you're doing this and you did, I don't know, let's say you made a square two by two by one on the inverse. And then you did forward and you got a two by two by two pseudo. Where does that pre-move go? You've already have these moves at the very end. So that goes before that one. I know I said before that your pre-move is always the very last move, but that's if that's the first thing that's there, if you didn't do any sort of ness, any inverse there. So for example, let's say we have our scramble and then we do a two by two by one block. And then we find if we do the forward, we can do a pseudo block. Well, that pre-move now goes here. Let's say now we do a two by two by three on the inverse that's a pseudo block. So that pre move now goes there. So we're just constantly building down this circle until it connects. Okay, so now there's one more thing that's kind of similar to NIS and it's called RNIS or reverse normal inverse scramble switch. It's a bad name. It's so bad that a lot of people don't even use it and they call it like skeleton switching or things like that. I think RNIS is here to stay though. So let's talk about it. What RNIS is, is just starting from anywhere in your scramble. So we're gonna go back to the fewest moves one that I did. And you can see in here, when I had two edges, two corners and one twisted, there is an algorithm that I know for that, but I couldn't find a good way for it to be set up. And so what I did was I put stickers on my cube and I like these ones from the company Avery that they are peelable and restickable. Um, they stick well enough, but I can peel them off without really leaving a bunch of residue on the puzzle. And what I did was I looked for a spot where all of the misoriented pieces are on the same layer, or often I'll find it where they are in a spot that can work really well to do, let's say, a sexy move. But so right here, what I did was I found that this spot right there, if I start my solution from there and do B2 L prime U prime L U R prime U prime R L2 D F2 R2 U, and then I do the scramble, R prime U prime F U. And then I do the rest of my solution that I have, U2 D prime F prime D. I get all the pieces on the same layer. And then what I did here was I added an L prime. Since this is the L layer, I did this. And what it did was it turned my two edges, two corners, and one twisted corner into three bad edges and three bad corners, which is much easier to solve 
and you have a lot of chances to use commutators for that. Or, you know, you can just find a good one to do a last layer algorithm. At a competition, I believe it was fewest moves of last year. I had a solution. I don't know where the solution is anymore, but I got a 25. And what I did was I believe it was something like 15 to three edges and three corners. And then I found a spot where I'm on the same layer and it resulted where I just had to do a G perm and it worked out really well. Here's another good example of using our NIST. So this is from the Speed Solving Forum. Um, I don't have my the date on here. Looks like I did it. Oh, this was actually, might have been the same group that I did that other Speed Solving Forum that I talked about. And so I had my scramble and my solution, which solved th up to three corners and five edges out of place. And what I try to do often is find a spot to insert, let's say a sexy move or something like that. So I stickered up those pieces and starting at this spot right here, I did D, B prime, L prime, R prime, F, and then the scramble, and then the rest of this. And it kind of turned into an, this sort of thing, almost F2, L minus two, but we have those corners in place. And so what I ended up doing was I did an F2, and then a sexy move. So F2, because that lined up those pieces. F2 and then sexy move, or part of sexy move. And when I took that out, it also inserted that edge. And now I have F2 L minus one with that edge already made. And it gave me a whole new kind of a start to this solve. And there's a lot of other things we could do from there. I tried a few different things, tried inserting like F2L and just finishing that way. Um, I think what I ended up doing, oh, I added a few more things and ended up going to three corners left. So I just solved the edges. Okay, and now we have insertions. I've kind of already shown it. I know some people that just do our NIST to find insertions. They either check every single spot of the skeleton or they just do specific spots because let's say if you have a lot of double moves in a row, like let's say F2, D2, B2, R2, that's not always the best to do a corner commutator. Edge commutator could work pretty well, but let's look at this. So this is a scramble just from a couple days ago from the Speed Solving Forum. We're gonna go through two things. First, just how you add insertions and then what a commutator is and how to do it because that's kind of the most important part with this. What you first want to do is figure out what pieces are out of place. I'm going to use my Shangshao gem because that is what works best for me for stickers because this frosted plastic makes the stickers go on and off very easily. So we have our scramble and our solution. And everything solved up to just a couple, few corners and a few edges. So here is what I do. Take some stickers and for edges, I'll write one, two, three and then I'll just place it. So this blue and this orange and blue, that needs to go to this spot. And then this orange and green needs to go right here. And that needs to go here. For corners now, what I'll actually do, and this is a bit excessive, this is a lot more than I think anyone who I've ever met does, but I'll put one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, on three different stickers. Now you may be wondering, why are you doing that? you technically only need to put it on one side. And the reason is I feel like I can find insertions much, much faster. For edges, I only put them on one side, but for corners, I put them on all three. Because what I end up doing is just looking for colors. I just look for where the colors match. So here we go, that red needs to go here. And then this green right there, and that orange, I'm gonna go back to there. If you have three pieces that all need to go around a three cycle, it should all work out. We have one color that just goes to the next, that goes to the next. Okay, so here's what I mean. I look for matching colors on sides and I can see yellow, yellow. That could work, but that's not in the best spot. We'll talk about that in just a second. But so what I did was then I worked backwards. Sometimes I'll solve and work forwards because I can get sometimes lost going backwards. Well, now the pieces are stickered, I can just do the scramble. 
and then just work my way forward. So D, R2, F, R prime, D2, F prime. And I see right here, so right here, I see two matching colors on bottom and one color on the side that's not in the same layer. I'll go over how to find insertions in just a second, but I see that a I can solve these three pieces. So three goes to here, that to there. So I'll do F, D prime, B, D, F prime, D prime, B prime, D. That also cancels two moves because D and D2 turn into a D prime and F and F2 turn into an F prime. And now all that's left is three edges. These three edges at that spot between right before the F2 are set up so I can just do like that. And then we have the F2. The first move was an L2, which canceled out that L2. The second move was a D, which canceled out that D prime. And so I added six moves, although I wrote eight. Let's fix that. There we go and canceled four at the same time. So I only added two moves to solve the edges. There are a lot more possibilities with edges as algorithms and other things you can do because there's commutators, which are 10 moves. There are other algs, which are eight moves. This is just a six mover, which is basically this alg. You can't do M slices, so you can see I have D and U prime, or if this way would be R and L moves. So you can do stickers or you can do RNS and just look at every spot. But let's talk about how you find commutators. I'm gonna use the same, the same stickers right now. I'll talk about corners first and then go over edges. So let's go through that scramble. What a commutator is, is A, B, A prime, B prime. B is not back, that's just the second letter. Meaning you do a move and then you do another move or set of moves and then you reverse the first one and reverse the second one. So for example, if let's say I'm holding like this, I'm gonna make the first move D. The second move, R, U, R prime. So then I reverse D, and that's gonna be a D prime. And then reverse R, U, R prime, which ends up being R, U prime, R prime. And that moves three pieces around without affecting the other ones. So how do you do this then intuitively? And Commutators are something that are quite simple, but I feel like they're always explained in really weird ways. And it's actually very easy to do. What you're gonna do is solve it exactly how you might insert a corner or do F2L. And the way I set things up is there's the insertion part and then there's the interchange. So with what I just showed you, I did the interchange first and then I inserted a corner. I could do the other way and let's say I'm doing L prime U2 L D2. So L prime U2 L is the insertion, just like it'd be a pair, D2, and then reverse. So L prime U2 L D2. The, L, the um, U2 and the D2 moves, the inverse is U2 and D2. And you can see again, three corners moved. So how does this work? So the way I think about it is that you're affecting two pieces on the bottom, and inserting one like F2L. And so I'll set, actually, yeah, I'll just set something up. So let's say I'm solving this. This piece needs to go here, this one needs to go here, and this one needs to go here. You have to have at least one piece oriented correctly down here and have whatever that bottom color is on the side as if it's F2L. So if you do F2L, you know that if the bottom color is facing up, you can't just insert it with three moves. There's two ways of actually doing this case. I could insert this here. So let's say doing B U2 B prime, that would insert that right there. And then doing D as the interchange. So we've got B U2 B prime D, then invert that B U2 B prime D prime. And that solved that. There's also another way of doing this. I could do put this one at here. So it's D prime's the first move and then R U prime R prime. And then D R U R prime. So there's multiple ways of doing it. Let's pull out that scramble again. What I will do is I have these colors and if there's matching colors like orange and orange, I know that that is what I want on the bottom 
And then, oh, I've got orange on top. That's like the bottom color facing up. So that doesn't work. There's no other colors matching. So we're just going to go on. We're going to do D. Nothing really changes. R2. Oop, green and green. Good. And I've got green on the side. So right here, this spot, I could throw in a commutator. I could do one goes to two, two goes to three. So I could do the first move as U prime and then insert B, D prime, B prime to insert that corner and then reverse it, U and then B, D, U prime. Or I could put this one here and do R, D2, R prime, U, R, D2, R prime and then U prime. Now let's say you're having trouble visualizing that. What you can also do is just look real quick and say, oh, this could be something and mark that spot and then do our NIS. So starting at that F, doing the scramble. Uh-oh. I think I might have messed that up. Let's find out. And then those two moves. Okay, I didn't mess it up. So good. So let's see where we had this. We had misplaced corner, misplaced corner, misplaced corner. So yeah, this one needs to go here, this one to here, and then that will go back to there. So I could do R, D2, R prime, interchange with a U move, and then R, D2, R prime, U prime. Or move this one to here first, insert that corner, and then back, and take out that corner. So you could mark a spot and do Arnis, or label it with stickers. You could just use one sticker. I use three. It takes me a few extra seconds. It's kind of like writing the inverse scramble on the page. It takes just a few extra seconds to do that, but it might save you a ton of time in the end. And yeah, I just mark all the spots and sometimes I will mark, like you can see right here, it's really small. It says a minus one. So when I got there, I was like, this removes one move. This removes two. Um, on average, you might have about three, sometimes none. I've had as much as nine on one solution. This was a fun 29 where I had this solution, which was 19 moves to two corners, two corners, and one twisted, meaning two corners were swapped, two corners were swapped, and one was twisted. So I inserted a commutator, which was eight moves, but also canceled eight moves that made it into good five corners, meaning one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five. It just was one big cycle. Then I insert a commutator that subtracted two moves and gave me a 25 with three corners. Now I couldn't find any good insertion from there, but I found a spot where I could do a commutator that didn't solve it, but kind of twisted a couple of them that actually canceled nine moves. They gave me a 24. And then I found another commutator that inserted and canceled eight moves and left me with a 24 that gave me three corners again. And then I found another one that gave me 29. Now doing five insertions in one solve, usually you don't have time for that. I had a ton of time with this one because I found the solution pretty soon. But hey, you can often do some weird things with it. And real quick, we're going to talk about edges. So you can solve edges in different ways. I'm going to fix these real quick. So there's kind of three big things I look for. A spot where they are set up like this. We can do a six move insertion. Another one is an algorithm like this, where one goes to here, two to there, and they're back. And, and this can be set up in different ways, but an eight move algorithm, or a commutator. And a commutator works the exact same way. So for example, here we have three edges out of place. And what I'm going to do, the commutator is going to be with slices. Now you can't do actual slices. So let's say this move isn't an E move. It is D U prime. And then you have to watch out though to make sure you're doing the right one. So for example, if I did this, what I just did there to write that out is 10 moves. It ends up being R D R prime, D, U prime, B, D prime, B prime, 
d prime u. Now, you might think that 10 moves is really bad, but because there's so many possibilities when you have edges and so many times you could do that, you'll often find really good places to cancel moves. And what a lot of people look for is that sort of r u r prime or anything like that because that's where you might be able to cancel the most moves because that happens in both edge and corner commutators. There are other algorithms that are good to know. So let's say, for example, f2, u2, f2, u2, f2, u2, if you have two edges, two edges. And also that a lot of algorithms could be moved in different ways. So for example, the one that is r prime l f2, r l prime u2, you can move one or both of the r's and l's to the end. So I could move them both to the end. Instead of starting with r prime l, I could just do f2, r l prime u2, r prime l, or just move one of them to the end and do l f2, r l prime u2, r prime. So a lot of them can be moved around like that. Hopefully this helps explain insertions and commutators. This is one of the most essential things for reducing your moves because you don't have to have such a linear solve. You can solve as many pieces as possible and just insert the rest. I had one solution in one of the weekly comps where everything was done except for seven corners. Almost every single corner was out of place except for one and luckily I was able to solve it with three commutators. Okay, and now we're here for our advanced sub 30 techniques, tips, and tricks. None of these things are actually difficult. None of these things are really super special, but they're not always as easily seen or intuitive. And the first thing we're going to talk about though is PDR or partial domino reduction. We'll get to full domino reduction in a second. Now this is a domino cube. What you notice is that the side layers can only turn 180 degrees while the top layers can turn 90. What domino reduction does, or even partial domino reduction, is you make it where you the whole thing can be solved, or at least edges, by just doing that. And here's how you set it up. So I'm just going to do a random scramble and then I'm going to actually show you a solve where I used this. The way you do PDR is you orient edges on two sides. So let's actually do white in front this time because we haven't done that one yet. And I'm going to orient edges. So I'm going to look to see what the bad ones are. I'm going to look for a red and orange on the top or bottom and here and here or white and yellow with green or blue adjacent to it. So for example, we have one, two, two bad ones that are red and orange. And then let's see here, that's good, that's good, that's bad, and that's bad. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four bad edges. And let's see, what would be a good way of solving this? I could do, and then I've put them all on this D side, so then all I have to do is that. Made a nice little block while I did that, so that was fun. Okay, so now I'll do the red axis. And I could hold it like this with green and blue on top, or I could actually still do yellow on top as well. But looking here, I'm gonna look for white and yellow, and we've got one, two, three, and then red or orange with green or blue adjacent. And that is four. So four bad edges, one, two, three, four. Now this, let me show you this cool little trick here because what I could do to put this in the right spot is I could do, let's say an F2, L2, D2, and put them all on this side. Or I could just do L and then F2, D2 because, oh sorry, L prime, because that solves these but makes these ones bad. There's different ways, there's so many different ways of going about orienting edges. But I put all the bad ones right here and now that. So remember when you set up I can no longer do 90 degree turns on white and yellow. So you can't do PDR and then do 90 degree turns on white and yellow. Once I already did that, that would mess up that axis. So now all the edges can be solved with only doing 180 degree turns on yellow, white, orange, and red. Corners, not exactly. We've got this corner could be this and this corner could be, but that's it. And what's nice with PDR is things can line up very nicely. So for example, um, 
There, I just made a block. And you can find things. Oh, I just made another block on accident. Um, so let's see here. Where is the blue edge? Um, there we go. So I could do this and then that. Then let's do this, this, this. And I'm just making blocks very fast, very intuitively. Now, sometimes what you can do is I've seen people where they get this far and then white's turning out really nice, so they switch to this. And you already have EO on this orange face, so you'll kind of mess up domino reduction, but now you can just sort of do your own thing. And this isn't efficient what I'm doing anymore, but I'm just sort of finishing the solve. Okay, so let me show you an actual solve that I did this. This is from the Speed Solving Forum. Um, I believe this was on the 15th I did this of July. And I looked up PDR so I can find this. I, with the scramble, I first started here and did U L prime and made a square. And then I did U to an R prime on the inverse and did an EO. There wasn't really a good EO to start. I found a four move EO. But after doing those two moves, I found a two move EO. So that worked. Then I did two more moves and made a two by two by two block. And then I did partial domino reduction. I don't think I said it, but it's called partial because you're not orienting corners with this. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to do the inverse of u. I'm going to do u prime b prime l u prime. And just to explain that real quick again. So if we have our scramble, right now I've got u l prime b u forward. And the inverse, I've got u2 r because that's the inverse of that one. So I'm going to go this way and do u prime b prime l u prime inverse of the scramble. And now from here, so I have that block made. Actually, I should have a two by two. Oh, I didn't do the u2 r prime. There we go. That's much better. So now from here, I couldn't really find anything great. So I was like, okay, I'll try PDR. And let's look for bad edges. So anything with red and orange or green and blue with white adjacent. So one, two, three, four. So these four. So what I did, now I was trying to figure out why that didn't quite work. And I think it's because I messed an R2. So I had to do F2, R2, D2. And I put the bad edges here and then F or F prime. And then we can solve the rest with just doing 180 degree turns. So for example, something like that. And now I'm just going to solve the rest, though, because I want to wrap this up. And that's all there is. And just like EO, things can fall into place really easily. But let's get to domino reduction. So domino reduction, you're also orienting the corners. This is something that people, a lot of people have struggled with and still kind of struggle with to figure out how to do that efficiently. So let me break it down to the easiest way. And I've got this special cube here with just these four pieces. The final turn of EO moves around four edges and four corners. So for example, let's say that's a bad edge, bad edge, bad edge, bad edge. And these all corners are not oriented. The final move will orient four edges, four corners. So if let's say, I'm just going to move this around. So I have scrambled this up. And if you've already done EO on one axis, so let's say orange and red, and you have four edges left, they're going to be two in the middle slice and two on the top and bottom. And that's always going to be the case if you have four left. Now, if you have four corners left like this, the way I think about setting it up is you want to set up pieces where the corners are on the sides of the top and bottom facing out. So this one's already done. That one's already set. And this process might not be super efficient, just linear. You might try inverse or setting things up. But here, again, you can't also, you can't do 90 degree turns on these layers. So what I'm going to do is do L2, D prime, L2, and that put that one here. Now I need to get this here. How do I do that? Well. And I just realized I have an impossible case that would not ever happen because I didn't realize one of the black ones is misoriented. So that's how it should be. And then U, B2. 
So that set up, that set up. Now, if you notice, these edges need to be on the same side. So something like this. And that was a few extra excessive moves. What I would often do then is go back and see if I can affect the edges beforehand, because usually you can. And then all you need to do is F. So there's other things you can have where let's say if you have two bed edges and three bed corners, there's different things you can do like setting it up where we have a bad edge here and one here, and then one bed corner facing out that way. So it's gonna be solved after doing an F move. Then that one lines up with that bar and the other one's back here. And then one more F move. There's also, we can have two bad edges and four bad corners. So for example, if let's say that edge is bad and that edge is bad, I know that these are gonna be fixed and then I swap them with these two. But let's do an actual domino reduction solve that I had. And so it was actually pretty linear. So I did the scramble and then EO was quite easy. I have a bad edge here, 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 and here. So all I did was D and R2, which put them all in the same face, and then F. And now for here, let's look on this side. We've got one, two, three bad edges, and then four, five, six, six bad edges. Well, if I do, let's say R prime, that's gonna leave me with four bad edges because it's gonna fix these three, but mess up that one. So if I do R prime, I've got that. So I've got a bad edge, one, two, three, four. And then one, two, three, four bad corners. And looking at what we have, we have this one on the top and also this one also on top. Those corners are already in place where they need to be on either side. So I need to get a corner here and then a corner also connecting to this one. And so what I did was took this corner and did D2, F2, and that lined it up there. Could just do D, B2, and that lines it up. But the problem is that kicks that edge out of place, which is not where we want it to be. So what I did was D2, U prime. Well, I'm just realizing I could have done something a little bit different. Well, I did L2, U, and then L. Oh, sorry, L. And now domino reduction, and you can tell it is because of the way those faces are. But I just realized I could have, let me check this, L, U prime, L2, U, D2. I could have just done U, R2, U, D2, L. Actually, that would have been the same move. I think I did try that, but I didn't like the way it turned out. So yeah, so there's always different ways of setting that up. But from here, the entire cube can be solved with just 180 degree moves on the side and then on the top and bottom, you can do 90 degree moves. And there's a few different things people do. If you have just partial domino reduction, a lot of people will just solve edges as fast as they can and then see what lines up with the corners. Um, some corners cannot be solved. If they're misoriented, they won't be. But that way you're just doing as what's most efficient. For this, some people just solve corners. They find whatever they can do to just solve the corners. And then they do insertions for edges because you can do slices, which can make it really efficient. I'll go into that. And then other people just try block building and finding what might be the best thing to do here. So for example, this is not going to be efficient, but we could do something like that to make a block. And again, it gets really easy to make blocks when you're doing this sort of thing. Um, like that, and blocks are just falling into place. What's difficult is if you, let's say, have any corners that are not solved, during, after that portion, after you've done domino reduction, you can't do a single just eight move commutator because everything's oriented in a certain way. So if you do use a commutator, you have to throw it in earlier, like I did here, right? Eight subtracted two moves. And then my edge commutator was six minus four. Now for practicing domino reduction, I literally just spent hours, many hours, just scrambling the cube, doing EO domino reduction, scrambling the cube, EO domino reduction, and just practice that until I got more used to pairing pieces up. I would say if you can get the domino reduction finished, so EO plus that, 
in 13 or, or fewer moves, that's good. Once you get a little beyond there, it might be a little excessive, but that also depends on what your average is. So this is for someone who is looking for kind of top level solves. Okay, so we have one more thing, and that is slice insertions, or what is now being called slicey shenanigans. Probably my favorite name. Arnis is the worst name in fewest moves. Slicey shenanigans might be the best. And what you're doing is slices to solve. Now, of course, you can't do a slice, so this kind of move would be U prime D. More specifically, that actually would be U prime D and then Y prime as a rotation, which is why rotations, I think, should be still allowed because we're really, this is becoming a new big thing. Another way you could call this is instead of doing that, you could also just do wide U and then U prime. That's another way of doing it. And that is just two moves. I like doing it with rotation though, because then I can more easily see what cancels. So I'm going to show you two different things. One, using slices for actually just solving it, but also using slices after it's already solved. When you do a slice, not only do you end up messing up or solving for edges, but you also mess up or solve for centers. Centers, some people write as CE, some people write as X, and I've been trying to do X because it's a little more efficient. So right now, the skeleton that I have for this scramble solved everything except for three edges and six corners, or five corners and one was twisted. And so what I did was I stick it up the puzzle. And so let's go through this. Now I know a lot of people who do slicey shenanigans and they just do our NIS. I like using stickers. So we've got the scramble and this is from the speed solving forum from July 2nd. Now I'm not worried about corners. So I'm just not even gonna do anything with that, but we are going to sticker up these three edges. If you use domino reduction or partial domino reduction, which is what this is, the edges are often very easily sliced because they're the ones that are in the middle layer or the east slice are always gonna be in the east slice. And the ones that are on the top and bottom are always gonna be on the top and bottom. So this one edge needs to go right here. And then that one needs to go right here. Okay. And let's see here, we've got this one, this edge needs to go to here, to two, and that red needs to go to there. Okay, so now this is actually a really nice spot for an insertion because with that one needing to go to two, I could actually just do L2 and then U prime D F2, U D prime. And those six moves wouldn't be too bad, um, but I don't really want to have 17 moves to bad six corners. So let's see if we can do some slices. And I just kind of work my way backwards to see where everything lines up. And there's a lot of places where something like this could. But right here, I see this. And again, I could just do sort of something I did before, but we can do some slices. So what I'm gonna do is do a slice that's going to not solve any of these, but mess up one more. And since we already have an L, if I do, a slice that is like this. What we'll notice is one goes to three, which it doesn't need to do. That's not where it's supposed to go. Three goes to two, which is not where it's supposed to go. And two goes here and that goes here. So I do this move. Technically it's L prime R X prime, or you could think of it as wide L L prime, but I'm going to do it like that. So we have L prime R and then X prime. So you can write it like that. And then with that now in front, D2, B2, D2, B, F prime, U2, F2. And what you notice, it looks really messy right now, um, partially because the corners aren't solved, but what we now have is this edge is fine, that edge is fine, that edge is fine. You have to really know where your centers are, know that that's normally the U center. Uh, I'm not gonna sticker the centers because I know exactly the move I did. So but now this one needs to go to where orange and blue normally is, which is back here. So that one needs to go to here. So I'm gonna move two to there. This two needs to go to here. Nope, sorry. That two needs to go to here. That's where it needs to go. And then three needs to go 
to here. And that four would go back to one. So then I find a place where I could slice back. And sometimes you have to do a setup move, but right here, I can just work my way backwards. And I've got, and remember, this is going to be top, this is front, even though it looks really wacky. Really just look at the edges you have solved for that help. And we've got F2, U2, F, B prime, D2. And right here, oh, they line up again. And this too, if I do a move the other way, an M prime, or let's say L, R prime, X, the opposite of that, one goes to, what, did I sticker that wrong? Let's find out. So one would go to two, two would go to three, three would go to four. So all I have to do now is just L, R prime, X, which is the same thing as an M prime, and then finish this. And we have edges solved. This one didn't cancel anything. This one did, the L prime and the L canceled. So I ended up solving edges by only adding two moves. And kind of two things to think about. Whatever your setup move is, if let's say you have to do, we'll just use M for an example. If you have to do an M2 left, the edges should be swapping two and swapping two. If you only did a 90 degree turn, it's a one to two to three to four kind of situation like that just was. I almost find slices as easier than other insertions because there's only one thing you're looking for. Do they line up? And if they don't, is it an easy setup to it? I know some people where they do slice and then it doesn't quite work. So they do a different slice and they, that doesn't work and they do a different slice and that doesn't work and then they finally find a solution that, that fits. Now you can also, let me go back to my search and find the next time there are slices. Right here I did slice after it's solved. So for example, this was already solved after here. I was missing three edges and I solved the three edges right there. But it was a 32, I didn't like that. I wanted to find something different. So what I did was at this spot, I did an E2, which you can also think of as U2, D2, Y2. Well, that U2, D2, Y2 canceled this U2 and turn this D into a D prime. So I added two moves, U2 and D2, and I canceled that U2, this U2, and then this D turned into a D prime, which also took away the D2. So I actually canceled a move while inserting that. And then they also, so they ended up lining up then right here. And let me kind of just show you, I'm gonna do R NIS from this R2. So I did R2, U2, L2, U2, D, and then I'm gonna do the E2, B2, D2, R2, D, R2, D, L2, D2, B, U2, D prime, F2, U prime, F2, L2, B2. Let's go to our scramble up here. We've got R prime, U prime, F, L2, L, U, D2, R, D, U, F, D2. And that is what that looks like. And how does that get solved? A nice E2, which is again, U2, D2, Y2, and that D2 cancels that. So I ended up doing slices after all of that. And I know a lot of people, if you have time um, to do this, go for it. I know a lot of people who, after they finished and they want to just see if they can eliminate anything else, they'll just see where they can insert a slice. And that is it. If you look at some of the top solves, you'll notice what they do is block build, edge orientation, insert. Domino reduction is getting really popular and slicey shenanigans is getting really popular because of that, because it's so much easier to do. But most of the top solves, a lot of them are just edge orientation, things like that. So let's go over some final tips and tricks. And I save this for the end because I referenced some of the things beforehand. So if you jump to here, welcome. There might be a couple things that are confusing, but let's first talk about the first tip that I have is parity. So what is parity in fewest moves? Parity is where instead of having, let's say a three cycle, three corners out of place, the three edges out of place, you have two edges, two corners, or maybe it's three edges and then two more edges that are swapped in two more corners. Now, something like that can just be solved with a J perm. And there are efficient J perms that I believe this one's 10 move. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. 
Yep, that's a 10 move J perm. And that one I've used a couple times. You find in your solution, in your skeleton, where they line up like this, like a J perm. And then you just do this special 10 move J perm algorithm. And there are some other things. So for example, the algorithm that a lot of people do for that OLL, if you do that with a wide move in the middle, meaning what that ends up doing is swapping these two pieces, swapping these two pieces and twisting this corner. So for example, So there's things like that, but there's a much easier solution to try to turn something like that parity into a couple three cycles. So let's go back to this one that we had earlier on, the one where we kind of talked about the circle. And right here at my skeleton, where I had two edges, two corners, one twist. I could insert that somewhere, but I couldn't find a good spot where it'd work. If you do a single 90 degree turn on a face that has those edges, you can often turn it into just a three cycle. And so I'm going to do RNS so you can see this more clearly. And right here, I found, I stickered the pieces and I found where they're all in the same spot. So we can set this up B2 L prime U prime L U R prime U prime R L2 D F2 R2 U. Let's go to the scramble. Okay. And so everything's on the same spot here. And all I had to do is an L prime. And it messed up these two edges. It also messed up this corner. But what it did was it solved this corner and solved this white edge. So now I have three bad corners, three bad edges, and I can insert with a corner commutator and an edge algorithm. So if you ever have parity for FMC, you can find an algorithm. But if you can find them on the same layer, do a U move, you're pretty much all set. The second tip that I have is to know your variations. I uh, showed that edge variation where instead of just doing R prime L F2 to start, you just do maybe F2 to start. Or just skip the R for the end. There's other algorithms. So for example, the, an edge algorithm that's eight moves that is R, U, F, or U2, F2, D2, L, B2, D2, F2. There's variations where you just swap the U and D and the F and B. So for example, I do the same R move, but I start with D, so D2, F2, U2, L, and then F2, D2, B2. Or where you can even move some of the D2s and things to the front. So check that out or even other things. So let's say a two edge and two edge. You could solve it like this. L2, L, U2, L2, U2, L2, U2. There's also variations like L2, D2, R2, U2, R2, D2. And with that, that from any order should work. So instead of starting with L2 and doing L, D, R, U, R, D, I could start with D and do D2, R2, U2, R2, D2, L2. Or start with R2, U2, R2, D2, L2, D2. Or U2, R2, D2, L2, D2, R2. And those all work. So the third tip is to know options. Don't think super linear. And this has given me some bad solves because I just thought way too linear about it. So for example, let's say right here, we have five corners out of place. But the way it's set up is that these two corners need to be swapped these two corners need to be swapped, and then we have one that's twisted. There's a few things we could do. We could untwist this corner by swapping um, one from here and one from here and using this one. Since these need to be swapped and these need to be swapped, if I involve a commutator that's the twisted one and one of each, it will be five corners out of place. So for example, I can just do like that, and then we have a good five corner solution. In good five corners or good five C means that it's just one, two, three, four, five instead of two, two, and then a twisted. We could just solve one piece. So for example, I could solve this one, put that one here, this here, and this here, and then you end up having three corners left and one twisted. Or we could solve one piece and involve the twisted one. So put this one here, this one here, and this one here, 
and then you have 2c, 2c. And all three of these then could be solved with two commutators, depending on what you want to do. Okay, well, let's say, what if you had more than three corners to insert or more than three edges? There is a lot of possibilities. Let's go with something simple first. And let's say we have five corners where they have to go one to two to three to four to five. So something like this. So this corner needs to go here. That needs to go right here. That one needs to go right here this to here, and then that one back to there. If it's, let's say, a good five corners, meaning that they just cycle through each other, you'll always land at the back at the right color. You don't have anything just twisted in place. And what you can do is number this as one, two, three, four, five. And there's a lot of options for commutators. One to, you can go one to two to three. You can go two to three to four, three, four, five, four, five, one, or five, one, two and any of those work. And if you find a commutator for any of those solutions, then you'll have three left. So let's just number these up. One, two, three, four, five. I won't do a color on every single spot, although I have done that in the past. And especially when I'm doing five corners, there's a lot to look at. And if you can just look at a color real quick, you can see if there's anything matching on the side, and then just go from there. That three needs to go to here. And that green needs to go to here, and that orange will go back there. So let's see here. So I just look for one, two, three, four, five. And is there anything that's on the same layer? So one and two are, but that those wouldn't work as the interchange. Um, four and five are, but that wouldn't really work. Ah, three to one. That works. And can I put two right here? I can. So what I can do is put two to three three to one, and then one back to two. And two is going to solve the three. There we go. So I solve two, and I have three left. And then I would go through my solve and try to find another spot for this. It's here, three to four, four to five. All that works as well. So I could do, oh, no, not like that. What about like this? Yeah, so three goes to four then interchange, and four goes to five. One thing you might also hear about is a thing called block commutators. Block commutators are commutators, but instead of just a corner or edge, you do a corner and an edge together. This rarely comes up, but there was a speed solving forum, fewest moves, where I ended up getting a 23 instead of, I think it was a 21 because I used a corner and an edge commutator instead of a block commutator. And it's basically the same idea. If you set it up, um, you'll have the two interchange ones on bottom. So like maybe here and here or here and here. And then you have a pair that you insert like that. So I could insert this pair right here, interchange, and then remove that pair, move that back. And that's a block commutator. This pair goes here, that goes here, and that back. And I think I had something like this. And what I did was in that solve, I just finished this with sexy move to solve the edges. And then I had three corners left, not realizing how a block commutator worked and how to do it. But yeah, so this one needs to go here and this to there. So I could do interchange, wide move, and back. Another tip, don't worry about starting over. The I would say the biggest problem that any fewest move solver has, and especially when they're, they're trying to develop their skills, is finding a good start or two good starts and just running with it. And what happens is you're trying to find something and then you kind of get stuck and you go to the inverse and you can't find anything good. You go forward and you can't find anything good and you're trying different things. And then half hour has passed and you're like, what's well, too late for me to start over? Never worry about starting over. Many good solves are just kind of lucky finishes. They maybe find something good to start, and that could end up well, or they try a bunch of different things, and one just happens to work. I've kind of started a thing where I will spend about 20 minutes just looking at every start I can possibly think of. If I find something really good, I'll, I'll do that, but um, and I'll see where that avenue goes. But usually, I'll just write down a few and say, that's pretty good, that's pretty good, that's pretty good, and then I can run through those after. Okay, and the final thing is, and this is goes once you learn how to do insertions, is that remember you're not solving the whole cube in any set way. 
if let's say you are you've got a two by two by three block done and let's say you find something really good right here but you don't have that edge in place don't worry about trying to get that edge there now that wasn't too bad because it's just three moves actually there's a couple of really nice things here um but if let's say you can just let's say that edge is not there and you do that don't worry about that edge you're not solving f2l um you could solve it later you can find something on the inverse but just solve as many pieces as possible so to close this off these are all the big techniques that people use to solve fewest moves in the fewest amount of moves. There are lucky solves. Don't get down on yourself if you can't find suddenly a, you know, world record solution. My solves were averaging like the best were around 36. And then I went to a competition and I got a 22, which at the time was fourth in North America. And it was a very lucky solve. I didn't have anything sub 30 for even a while after that. Now I'm getting sub 30 almost every other solve, if not more than that. But even then, if I get above that, often I'll see a lot of people with the exact same scramble having bad solutions. And everything's relative with where you're at at the moment. Just like CFOP and speed solving, just knowing the information doesn't mean you will automatically have world record times. It takes practice. Have fun with it. Think of it like a Sudoku where you just sit down peacefully and have fun. You can just do solves on your own, but there's places Cubing Time has a scramble each week that does have a timer on it, so you're li really limited with that. All the other online competitions still try to stay within an hour just because, you know, they're, everyone's trying to be respectful of each other and try to make sure that they're all abiding by the rules. But the Speed Solving Forum has a mean of three. There's a Fewest Moves Facebook group, which has a mean of three, and the Fewest dash moves dot info either has one or a mean of three this is in my opinion the most fun event although there's a lot of luck in finding a good solution you could be any age and it doesn't matter that much how fast you are so if you have any questions like i said in the beginning leave them down below if you have watched this entire thing thank you so much i'd love for you to leave a like and subscribe and as always stop by speedqbview.com for more news and reviews Hey, Sean here from speedqbview.com. Um, I, okay. And this is actually a really nice place to do an insertion because there,